Welcome to Spine Conference. Today's Spine Conference uh, is a little bit unusual. There is no audience as uh, the conference was this morning. And unfortunately, because of technical reasons, it was not recorded. So I'm just reviewing all the information that we discussed this morning uh, in a much quicker format, but uh, there's no discussion. So it's a case-based learning. This is a 56-year-old man with uh, chronic uh, mid-thoracic back pain. Uh, he presented to his primary care physician with back pain. Uh, he was prescribed um, monster oils, muscle relaxers, physical therapy. He didn't get better after six weeks. Then he went to the orthopedic surgeon, had an x-ray, uh, which was relatively normal appearing, had more physical therapy, a brace, didn't get better. He finally had an MRI, which showed an infection of the spine, uh, and uh, he was referred to me. This was in 2010, seven years ago. His past medical history, uh, smoker, COPD, truck driver. And you can see on the... On the lateral x-ray, um, there's a deformity of the spine, but it's very subtle. Uh, and he has obvious ankylosing spondylitis. He, um, he has obvious uh, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, the, the spine is totally solid. Um, this patient uh, is a typical ankylosing spondylitis where he has hip involvement. 30% of hip involvement, 8% have total hip replacements. You can see the lateral view, uh, bridging bone at every single level of the spine. The sacroiliac joints are obviously fused. Now, the first image that we had was just the MRI scan. You can see this MRI is very unusual. The, there's three bodies involved. It looks like this entire T8 vertebra has something going on, maybe an infection. But basically what this is is all edema, and he, he doesn't really have uh, discs to... Um, differentiate the levels. He's all just one solid bone. That's why the whole area is edematous. So it does make sense that this possibly could be an infection, but it's really not. It's a, it's a fracture. The minute, minute I saw him, I ordered a CAT scan, and you can see on the CAT scan, it's very obvious this is a fracture, but you can see how you could be easily fooled with the MRI scan. Uh, also note the epidural space is no hematoma. The coronal section again shows the fracture through and through. Again, the MRI scan, if you just saw this uh, with, without a history and without um, uh, x-rays, uh, it would be an unusual uh, finding. So what causes these fractures? That was a question in the conference. I mean, was it a trauma? I said, no, it wasn't a trauma. So I mean, trauma can cause fractures in ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, the other possibility is it's just not fused in the disease process. So the whole spine doesn't fuse from zero to one immediately. It, it goes in stages. But... I think usually these things are fatigue fractures, similar to a tibia with a, um, a basketball player with a tibia um, stress fracture. So intraoperatively, you can see the line uh, where the fracture was, the spine, the interspinous process was totally fused, the facets are fused. You can see where the sucker is. This is where the fracture line was posteriorly. And then once I found, once I found the fracture line, I just put four screws above and below. And basically, uh, this is enough uh, to stabilize the spine almost always using the intraoperative films. So did everything go well? It did. He felt great. In fact, the next morning, he said he felt better from spine surgery, which is unusual because spine surgery usually hurts. But he said he felt better from the spine surgery now that the fracture was fixed. But then he came back three months later, and he was telling me his back hurt. I got more x-rays, and they were normal. I wasn't sure what was going on. I had no suspicion that anything was going on as the x-rays were normal. This is just a, a reminder that when ankylosing spondylitis patients get a fracture, it's a through and through fracture. So there are many ways to describe ankylosing spondylitis historically. It's two to one males for female, one to two per thousand. It's never found in Aborigines. One percent worldwide incidence. Uh, ankylosing spondylitis is a seronegative spondyloarthropathy. Uh, so it's in a similar disease process to reactive arthritis or reactive arthritis. The way the x-ray looks is, uh, people call it bamboo vertebra. Squaring of the vertebra, bridging syndesmal fight, it looks like a bamboo spine. You can see the x-ray on the bottom right and that bamboo, it looks very similar. You can see here the whole spine is fused, the sacroiliac joints are fused, and there's just bridging syndesmal fights and the vertebral bodies look very square. How do you make the diagnosis clinically? Inflammatory back pain 
is insidious, dull, migratory, goes back and forth, sometimes on the right, sometimes on the left, sometimes in the buttock, lasts for more than three months, better when they exercise. This is in contrast to, say, this disease, which hurts more when you exercise. Hurts in the second half of the night, people wake up, have to walk around, more, morning stiffness, more than just 30 minutes, so everyone's stiff when they first get up, but if it lasts longer than that, think ankylosing spondylitis. It responds well to nosteroidals, as does many things, and... Um, it, you should be suspicious of ankylosing spondylitis if you have a relatively young person, less than 45 years of age, with a normal MRI. Um, other uh, um, symptoms and findings are um, uh, dactylitis, uveitis, a family history, HLA-B27 positive in the blood, sacroiliitis. 90% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis express the HLA-B27, but just because you're HLA-B27 doesn't mean you have ankylosing spondylitis. This is just the demographics. Schober's test is when you have patients flex forward, their skin doesn't move. It should stretch normally. This is just a measure of a stiff spine. And the ribs should expand when people take a real big deep breath by 2.5 centimeters. I usually just hold my hands on the ribs and see if they expand. Chin brow is very important. People get stiff in certain positions, and if you get stiff in the A position, it's a disaster. Uh, C position, you pretty much have a normal eye. If you're walking around, you can see the horizon. The diagnosis uh, by the modified New York criteria is one clinical um, finding and then radiographic findings of sacroiliitis. An MRI, the sacroiliac joint, um, can give you a diagnosis. Here's a differential of... Uh, uh, sacroiliitis, sacroiliitis, many things can cause it. You can even go online uh, and look it up. The treatment is nasteroidals and after that, um, uh, immunological uh, uh, moderators, which uh, may be immunosuppressive. So fractures, 1% of people fracture per year, and um, they can be very serious. So back to our guy. So he was having symptoms. Two years post-op, unknown to me, he came to the ER for shortness of breath and he had a cat scan of his lungs. And this showed an obvious fracture line. He didn't heal. And you can see here posteriorly, he's developing more callus posteriorly. Then he came five years post-op for the same uh, reason, hypoxia. And you can see now the callus is bigger. And posteriorly, there's even more callus. So seven years post-op is now when he came in recently. And it was different. I came in not only with back pain, but he lost his bladder control and he couldn't walk. His legs were weak. He was numb from the groin to the toes. Um, he came in the middle of the night. The next morning, I ordered a uh, CAT scan and I saw what was an obvious non union, a hypertrophic non union, and severe pressure on the spinal cord. And here you can see uh, this very large hypertrophic non union. The implants look normal. Uh, on the x-rays and the CAT scans, so I wasn't sure what was going on because the implants didn't look loose. Here you can see the spinal canal at T8, and then at T7, 8, you can see the very small spinal canal from the hypertrophy um, of the hypertrophic union compressing the spinal cord. Here's his x-ray, look normal. So it took him to surgery uh, very quickly because he was basically an incomplete spinal cord injury. And the, the rod was fractured, but it was non-displaced. That's why you couldn't see it on either the CAT scan or the X-ray. So I removed all the implants, and I did a very wide laminectomy, which was very difficult because it was very thick. And I got a small CSF leak, and some of the I, I couldn't remove uh, some of the bone. It was totally scarred down the dura, and I didn't want to tear the dura further. So I left some of the bone floating over the dura, uh, and um, and I put a duragen patch on. Uh, this small piece of bone that I left um, was disconnected from the posterior element, so it was just floating on the dura, so I didn't think it was causing any compression. So here's the intra uh, films, and you can, hear, you can see here the decompression of the spinal cord. You can see how much bone I had to remove to get down the spinal canal. And here's a little fleck of bone that was left, and you can see this black image is the spinal cord. And this fleck of bone is just floating on the spinal cord. I didn't want to take it off. I didn't want to further the CSF leak. You can see here the wide posterior laminectomy that I performed. Uh, so the patient clinically been fantastic. I kept him down for 48 hours and then got him up and he felt absolutely great. His legs were normal. He was walking around. Uh, he felt fine. 
And these are just clinical images. Yesterday, actually, he came in the office yesterday. He's got a 25 degree chin brow angle. Um, and uh, he feels great. He wants to go back to work. So this is just a cartoon of what the chin brow vertical angle is and also the gaze angle. Here's his post-op x-ray. I added two more screws. So I added six points above, six points below to give it more stability for this in the heel. And I also encouraged him to stop smoking, which he did. So he's he does not smoke now. So I think he's going to go in the heel now. So spondylodiscitis, I believe, is a, is a stress fracture. Um, you can see here the stress fracture in the tibia, say the basketball player. And this is very long bone that has a long lever arm on it, and it just can fail. And it just keeps failing over time, and then it tries to heal itself, and it develops a hypertrophic nonunion. Risk factors for um, nonunions are cigarette smoking, metabolic disorders, and infection. Excessive motion, say if you have failure of implants, uh, non instrumented allograft uh, only hip arthritis. So how do you make a diagnosis of pseudothrosis? X-rays are, are really not so helpful. Usually it's just thin cut CAT scan. Say on this CAT scan, you can see this is this is no bridging bone across here, nor here, it's all uh, immature. A thin cut CAT scan is really the best way to diagnose it. MRI I haven't found to be very uh, helpful. Ultrasound, not nuclear medicine, it's not that helpful. Options in general for, for uh, spinal fusion, I think iliac crest is the best way to go. So the causes of pain recurrence after a spinal fusion. So you do a fusion, and people come back, and uh, usually it's six to nine months later, and they say um, they have pain. Uh, I think it takes six to nine months for the uh, pain, thin pain nerve fibers to grow into the fracture site, or the non-union site, so that the afferents can grow the brain and, and give you pain. But the causes are basically non-union, which it never healed in the first place, and that's a very difficult diagnosis to make as a surgeon because you always want to think that everything worked well. Adjacent segment degeneration or facet stenosis uh, or instability above a previous fusion. Uh, there's always a chance that the pain generator was never included in the fusion mass, so you got it wrong, or the pain generator is not even in the spine, say it's a pancreatic cancer or tumor, peritoneal tumor that gives this is a case of an L5 S1 posterior uh, instrument fusion just on one side because it's on the side that does not have instrumentation, there was a pedicle fracture. And he went on to a non union. He didn't heal. He had persistent pain, came back a year later, and the cascade showed immature fusion, should be matured by now, one year out, and a lucid line. Um, so he has a non L5 S1 non union. This was an easy case because he was thin, so the anterior lumbar interbody fusion with a femoral cortical ring allograft is a very safe, easy, effective way get this to heal. This is another case, uh, one year post-op with persistent pain. You can see here L5, S1 is solidly fused, but L4, L5 is immature. Uh, Cascade L5, S1 solidly fused, L4, L5 has very little bone formation. Again, Cascade, so this is loosening of the uh, L4 screw, halo loosening sign, and a lucent line across the facets, which is uh, consistent with non-union. You can look at all these images. There's a fracture line across uh, the L4 or 5 segment consistent with non-union, same on the coronal sections. So in this case, I thought it was, he was a large man with a very large abdomen, so the anterior approach would not be good. Uh, he, I just revised him posteriorly, put BMP and also an antibody graft. So the two articles I reviewed for this conference is the impact of smoking on complication pseudothrosis rates from single and two level fusions. We went over the paper. Basically, for one levels didn't matter, but for two levels, the non-union rate went up significantly, 29% versus 10%. The only risk factor for complication was obesity. Uh, and in this study, 18% were smokers. This was over uh, 21 years. You can see here the difference. Um, these are this is two levels. The non-union is three times as much as the in the smokers as the non-smokers. In the single level fusions, there's no difference in fusion rate. Uh, for smokers, not smokers. Uh, this was an article uh, from China uh, in treating uh, spondyl discitis or uh, stress fractures in ankylosing spondylitis patients. Here, here's an ankylosing, sp ankylosing spondylitis patient fracture, and they here's, here's a fracture again. They treated it with four points above, four points below, and then taking the iliac crest and basically debriding the fracture site and sticking the iliac crest in the fracture site to help it heal. And they found everybody healed. They, sometimes they did it through a transverticular approach, sometimes transforaminal approach. And in their uh, case series, 
everybody healed. Personally, I'm not sure if this is absolutely necessary, as usually ankylosing spondylitis cases or hypertrophic non-unions, it should heal. Um, these are just two more interesting cases. This is a case from 20 years ago that I saw a 60-year-old 60, 60 woman with C5 quadriplegia. What happened two months prior to admission, she went to the emergency room with an asthma attack. She was intubated emergently and since then had neck pain. And then one month prior, she went to an outside doctor um, uh, in uh, Northern Virginia and had an ACDF. Um, I don't think that doctor realized that she had ankylosing spondylitis. Um, she was then transferred to me when I was at GW with C5 quadriplegia. See here is the plate and screws, which looks okay, but the MRI shows um, that the spine is totally straight and then the spine is straight here and this, this is where the fracture was. Um, so there's no way a plate can hold this fracture and it wasn't reduced anyway. Uh, you can see the poor quality of the MRI from 1998. And the CAT scan shows the plate and screws. Again, it's poor quality because the CAT scan was from 1998. But you can see the error. Here's the posterior uh, wall of the vertebral body of C6. Here's the posterior wall of C5. You can see it's displaced. So basically the ACDF was done in the supine position, which extended the neck, which, recreate, which created this deformity. So I took this patient to the operating room. I did it with neurosurgery. We took the plate out, put on a halo, and just put her in a slightly flexed position, which totally reduced the fracture. And here's the post-op myelogram, which shows the spinal cord is fully decompressed. This is one more case which I think is interesting. It's a non-union case. It's a 50-year-old woman who has C5, C7, ACDF, but she had an intra-op acephaly. And I was worried about her airway, so I got a CAT scan the, the post-op day one. And the CAT scan showed that the airway was okay, but also it looked like it's fused. If you look at this CAT scan, the sagittal cut, it looks like the inner body graft, it looks like the vertebral bodies are fused. Here's the sagittal cut, here's the coronal cut. But you know she's not fused, she's only post-op day one. Came back a year later with recurrent pain, and you can see here she has a non-union. So it just goes to show you that a non-union takes time to develop, usually a year. And the immediate CAT scans look like they're fused, but they're not. And basically, you jam that piece of bone in there uh, under pressure, so it looks fused. Okay, thanks, everyone, for listening to Spine Conference um, today. I'll see you next month.